Good morning and welcome back to online worship with Redeemer Church. Uh, For the foreseeable future, we're going to continue this, but uh, the session is going to talk about uh, what we're doing and we are keeping an eye on cases in the community. And we'll let you know as soon as we can through email, the website, uh, if we make a change uh, and start to do uh, in person again. But please watch for news about that. Uh, If you would like to send in your tithe, please do that again to the P.O. box, uh, not the physical building at the church, but to the P.O. box. Uh, And we are still taking donations for our benevolence fund, that is to help uh, those who happen to be in need. Uh, So if you would like to designate specifically to that, please write that uh, in the memo line on your check. That is for the benevolence fund. Uh, So Sunday worship will continue uh, online. And uh, But we are glad you're here and joining us, and we hope that you uh, have an encouraging time of worship uh, wherever you may be. Take a few moments to prepare your hearts for worship of our mighty God. Our God calls us to his worship from his word, from Psalm 51. Hear it now. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as our mighty, glorious God. Father, we have divided hearts. Father, sometimes we love, adore, and seek you, and Father, sometimes we love our sin. Father, we pray that you would strengthen us against our sin, and most of all, to give you glory for your mighty grace that you have shown us in spite of our sin, in spite of our rebellion. Father, we pray that you would be with us and strengthen us to honor you well in all we say, do, and think in this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Please take your worship materials, and uh, we will sing together. Please sing wherever you are, uh, and can it be. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood. Died he for me who caused his pain for me who him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that thou God should die for me. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? He left his father's throne above. So free, so infinite, his grace humbled himself, so great his love, and bled for all his chosen race. Tis mercy all immense and free. bound in sin and nature's night. Thine I diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dawn. 
And Can It Be happens to be one of my uh, favorite hymns. And uh, it's, it's that part that describes us being in the dungeon and how God blasts us out, um, blasts us out. And yet we are in that dungeon because of our sin, justly because of our sin. So let us come before our God uh, this morning and confess our sins before him. Please read and pray with me our corporate confession of sin. Forgive us, Lord, for we are not faithful followers of you. We confess that in religious duties, our lips and the feelings of our hearts have not always agreed. We have taken your name carelessly on our tongues and trampled on your kindness with our many sins. How can we ever thank you for your faithful patience with us, your very unfaithful children, Father, forgive us. Take a few moments to silently confess your sins of this week before our God. Dear brothers and sisters, I read this to you as much as to myself. Our mighty God does not leave us in our sin but he assures us of his pardon in so many places in Scripture. I'll read this morning from 1 Corinthians 6. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do praise you. Father, we are so far from deserving your grace, and yet here we are. You have saved and washed us, your people. You have made us clean and whole and given us Christ's righteousness. Father, we praise you and thank you so much. Father, we plead with you that we would be your people, that we would be those who seek to fulfill your word in all that we say, do, and think. Father, may we be a light, may we be a sweet aroma, may we be those who honor you in all places and all times, Father, that your enemies would be put to shame by the holiness that we have on display. Father, we plead this morning for Stephen Barron, for the health issues that he's facing. We pray for wisdom for Beth and Dwight in all the decisions they're having to make for him. Father, we plead for wisdom for the medical staff who are working with him. Uh, Father, we, we just beg for guidance and freedom from anxiety. Father, we plead for Dwight as he battles the fevers that have beset him for so long. Father, we pray that you would grant him relief uh, from this by your mighty hand. Father, we plead for 
Gary Smith as he undergoes this chemotherapy. Father, we praise you that his kidneys are responding a bit to this treatment. Father, we plead for your presence with him, and also for his peace and that for his family. Father, we beg for wisdom for our government leaders, that they would rule wisely and well. Father, that they would um, rule with justice and righteousness. Father, they would take from your law and apply it to where uh, they rule and reign. Father, we plead for your gospel to go forth. We plead for it to go forth here in Silva, in Jackson County, in our state, our nation, and our world. Father, your people, we seem small and weak. But Father, please use us. For you are pleased to use the weak to shame the strong. Father, please be with us in the rest of this worship and time, and may your word encourage and strengthen us for your name's sake. Amen. Good morning. Once again, welcome to Redeemer Church. Glad that you are able to join us online for worship. We continue our study through the book of Luke right now. I'd invite you to find your Bibles and turn in there to Luke chapter 2. Uh, as you're making your way to Luke 2, um, it begins a very familiar way with the birth of Christ. We are going to gloss over the birth of Christ this morning and focus primarily on the end or the middle section of Luke chapter 2. Not because the birth of Christ is not important. Obviously, it's incredibly important, but we were just there a few weeks ago for a Christmas Eve service. But we will do a brief recap. Uh, we know the story well. Uh, Joseph and a very pregnant Mary travel to Bethlehem to be part of the census, we are told. While they are there, she goes into labor and delivers the Lord Jesus, the baby Jesus. There's no room for them in the inn, as we all know, so he is born in a stable. We're also told that angels appeared not too long after his birth to shepherds out in the countryside to tell them what exactly has happened. The shepherds go into town, they find the stable where Jesus has been born, they share with Mary and Joseph what they have heard, and after spending some time with them, they go back to their lives and to their work, uh, proclaiming and worshiping the things that they've seen, particularly worshiping God. We are then told by Luke in verse 21 that at the end of eight days, Jesus was circumcised. This was according to Jewish tradition. And at that point, we're told that he's formally given the name Jesus. Again, according to Old Testament Jewish tradition, a boy would be named formally after his circumcision. This brings us to the rest of Luke chapter 2, where Luke tells us two stories, one involving the baby Jesus the other involving the boy Jesus, but both center around uh, the temple. And so before we look at those, please join me as we ask God to bless this time in his word. Our God and our King, Father, again, we thank you for your eternal word. Father, we pray that as we uh, read some familiar passages about the Lord Jesus when he was a baby and then years later as a 12-year-old, uh, Father, we pray that you would give us ears to hear what you have to say. We thank you for your word, Lord, may we be different people because of spending time with you and your word even this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. There's an old saying that you never know what someone goes through unless you walk a mile in their shoes. And I can say being a dad now, I understand just how much work my own parents and grandparents put into their children or into their grandchildren. Um, parents invest a lot into their children. Before a child is born, furniture might be rearranged for a place for the baby to sleep, or maybe a room is cleaned out or painted a different color. A lot of work is done, but then when the baby arrives, the work really begins, right? Uh, babies are held, uh, they're fed, they're changed, uh, they're snuggled, usually in that order, but everybody is different, of course. But the greatest things that we do for our children are actually spiritual things, right? Even before uh, the little boy or little girl was born, aren't we praying for them? We're asking God to save them from their sin, just as we have trusted him to save us from our own. We ask God to bless them not only with a relationship with himself, but to grow them in that relationship, to provide help for them, uh, to help them in this life that he has called them to. Well, Mary and Joseph were good parents, and they sought to do things, spiritually speaking, for the benefit of their son, Jesus. And Luke tells us this, in Luke chapter 2, in fact, no less than five times in the last half of Luke 2, he tells us that Mary and Joseph did something on behalf of Jesus for one simple reason. 
in accordance with the law of the Lord. They were obviously godly parents seeking to honor the Lord with this baby that he had entrusted them with. As I mentioned, we're going to look at two big events, uh, the first involving the baby Jesus, and then we'll switch gears as Luke does and look at the story with Jesus in the temple as a 12-year-old. But first event is uh, found in verse 22, which we'll read in just a second. Uh, but Jesus is just a baby. His parents take him to the temple. Uh, and as they do so, it really fulfills, it does several things. One thing it does is it fulfills the law of God. So follow along as I read verse 22. Luke tells us, When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they, being Mary and Joseph, brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle, turtle doves or two young pigeons. So Joseph and Mary took Jesus to the temple to fulfill the law of God really for two specific reasons. The first was for purification. We have to remember that at this time the Jewish people were still under the Old Testament Levitical laws. And in Leviticus 12, we read that if a young woman has given birth to a son, that she will be ceremonially unclean for about 40 days. After that time, they are supposed to bring the child, the baby, to the temple, present to the priest, along with a lamb for sacrifice, as well as a bird, a pigeon as well. But if you notice in this case, Mary and Joseph did not bring a lamb as a sacrifice for a very good reason. They couldn't afford it. They didn't have the money to do so. But if you look at Leviticus 12.8, you'll read that what was acceptable was two pigeon doves in place of a lamb, which is what they obviously offered. It's just a great reminder of the humble means that Jesus was born into. Truly, the humility of his incarnation is simply stunning. But the other reason Mary and Jesus took Jesus to the, excuse me, Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple was to present him to the Lord, verse 22. Again, this goes back to the Old Testament and to the time of the Exodus. God told Moses that the firstborn among Israel, whether it was man or animal, belonged to the Lord. He tells Moses, these things, these are to be consecrated to me. In other words, these words show God's rightful claim to the life of every firstborn son in Israel. Children were, of course, to be raised by their parents, but it's almost like they had to acknowledge God's sovereignty by offering a sacrifice to redeem their son. Uh, think about it this way. Uh, the parents would come really with open hands saying, we thank you for this child, but we acknowledge that he belongs to you. Kind of a statement of trust, if you will. Jesus being presented at the temple not only fulfilled God's law, though, as we're going to see, it did something else. It encouraged God's people, in this case, to specific people. When Jesus was presented there by God's sovereign plan, there were two older saints there, one by the name of Simeon and one by the name of Anna. One of Luke's distinct literary styles is to introduce people in pairs. So, so for example, we've already met not only Mary, but Mary and Elizabeth. We met Jesus and John. Now in Luke 2, he shows us Simeon and Anna together. So let's begin again reading at verse 25. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came with the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, I'm going to hit the pause button there. We don't know much about Simeon. It's possible that he was a priest. I would say it's highly possible, but we simply don't know. But what we do know about him is very important. If you look back at verse 25, we have revealed his character. A righteous man, a devout man, a patient man who was patiently waiting for the coming of the Christ. In fact, verse 26, Luke tells us that this man has received a special promise from God through the Spirit that he would not die, he would not depart this earth until his own eyes had seen the Christ child. You can only imagine how often he performed his duties if he was indeed a priest, day in and day out, seeing countless babies come in, probably asking himself the same question, is this the one? Is this the Christ? Is this is the one that will fulfill the Lord's promises to his people? 
He continued day after day until that fateful day when God's Spirit led him to Mary and Joseph, more importantly, led him to Jesus. And so God's Spirit confirmed to Simeon, this is the Christ. And much like Zechariah last week and Mary, what does Simeon do? He responds in song. So let's look again at verse 28. Simeon took up in his arms the, the baby and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And his father and his mo mother marveled at what was said about him. I mentioned last week that Mary's song was called the Magnificat and that Zechariah's song is called the Benedictus. Well, Simeon's song has a name from the Latin as well. It's called the Nunc Dimittis, and it means now I am departing, or now you are dismissing. And there's two important things about this song we need to see. First, in verse 29, Simeon speaks about his final departure, and yes, he is talking about his death, his physical death. Remember, he was given that promise by God that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now he has seen the Lord's Christ. What does that mean? It means he's prepared to die. And the principle for you and I is pretty obvious, I hope. Those who have seen the Christ in the salvific use of that word, those who have been saved by Jesus, are prepared to die. Those who have not seen the Christ are certainly not prepared to die. The second important thing, though, we see in Simeon's song reminds us of this that the baby that Simeon was holding wasn't just for Simeon. It wasn't just that Simeon can now be at peace knowing that he was going to see the Father. It wasn't even just peace for the Jewish people. Listen to what he says back in verses 30 through 32. He boldly declares this baby will be a light for the revelation to the Gentiles. And this is important because just a few verses earlier, as the angels are revealing Jesus to the shepherds, they speak of this revelation to the Jewish people. But now, through Simeon's song, it's going global. Even at this early stage of Jesus' tenure, to use that language, the gospel is going forth in a missional aspect. And this is wonderful to read, but again, Simeon, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, has more to say, so look with me at verse 34. Again, Simeon is still speaking. Behold, this child, the Christ, the Christ child, is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And with these words, Simeon offers the first glimpse of suffering that Jesus would have to endure on the cross, and even the suffering that Mary would endure watching her son die, as he says, a sword will pierce your own soul also. Up to this point in the gospel, Luke, through Mary and Zechariah and the angels, has shown us uh, Jesus' rightful divine lordship, his royal kingship. Uh, he has shown us the peace that he will bring to his people. But here we learn that Jesus will not only bring these wonderful things, he will be the source of opposition to others. He will be rejected. He will be humiliated. He will be mocked. People will take their stand in a very visceral and very visceral way against him. It reminds us of Isaiah 53, verse 3, where Isaiah prophesied about what would happen to the Christ. He writes this, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as of one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. God's plan for salvation was for all of his people, but it was not for everyone. And this is why Simeon speaks about the rising and falling in relation to Christ. This explains why sometimes when we share the gospel with co-workers or family members or neighbors or friends, sometimes God saves someone and they come to faith in Jesus and it's wonderful to welcome a brother and sister into the family. But it also explains why there's other times where we share the gospel when maybe someone just responds by not responding or maybe they respond in a very angry way. Uh, maybe they have um, something against Jesus and we should not be surprised by that. Simeon prophesied that this child, the Christ, would be responsible for the rise and the fall of many. Luke continues and he introduces us to another saint that happened to be there. It wasn't just this man of faith that was there, but there was this incredible woman of prayer there by the name of Anna. Verse 36, And there was a prophetess 
Anna, the daughter of Phineal of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Again, like Simeon, we don't know much about Anna, but what we know is significant. The first thing is, verse 36, she was a prophetess. A prophetess was simply someone who spoke to God's people on behalf of God. Again, go back to the Old Testament. A priest was one who went uh, to God on behalf of the people. So a priest would offer sacrifices for himself first because priests were sinners as well, and then offer sacrifices for the sin of the people. A prophet was someone who would receive word from the, from the Lord, sometimes through a dream, and then would take that word, was responsible for taking that word to the people. Usually we think of prophets as being men, and that's a fair statement. But there are prophetesses in the Old Testament. In fact, there's seven of them, and then there's several more in the New Testament. But it was still a very rare calling. But Luke tells us that this woman, Anna, was a prophetess. We also know that she was a widow. Uh, we don't know when she got married. In those days, uh, young girls got married much younger than today, 13, 14. So if that was the case, then she was married till she was about 20 or 21. Because, again, we don't know why, but her husband died, and she was a widow from that time forth. We also know that she was of the tribe of Asher, uh, the daughter of Phineal. Phineal simply means face of God, which I think is very appropriate given the character of this praying woman. Um, we also know that the greatest things about Anna are found in verses 37 and 38, if you look back there quickly. She was a woman who worshipped and witnessed to God's grace. We read in verse 37 that she never left the temple. It's probably Luke's figurative language to tell us that she was consistently there, that she spent most of her time there. <clears throat> and what was she doing while she was there? Praying, fasting, worshiping, and now being led by God's Spirit to see the Christ child, what does she do? She starts to tell others, listen, he is here. God is doing the work that we've been longing and waiting for him to do. <clears throat> I've had the opportunity in my life, I've been blessed with mostly good health so that I could participate in sports. Um, either as a player or as a coach. And one thing I've noticed in the sporting world is this. Most coaches and most teams have expectations for their players. And the expectations go like this. We expect you to do your best both on and off the field. There's kind of an unwritten or maybe a written code of conduct, if you will. And when an athlete chooses to embrace those principles and do that, what happens? Well, they not only honor the coach or the organization that's telling them this is what we expect of you, but they're also encouraging other teammates as well. Uh, they're kind of leading by example, if you will. And the reverse is also true, obviously. When an athlete acts in a poor way, uh, maybe on the field, maybe it costs points, maybe it costs a game, but it's certainly demoralizing. <clears throat> and I realize it's not the best of illustration, but here what we have is Jesus, even as a baby, being led by his parents, ultimately being led by God's Spirit, to fulfill the law of God. And as he fulfills the law of God, it's an encouragement to God's people, specifically to Simeon and Anna here, but an encouragement to you and I as well, because we read these verses even these 2,000 years later. You know, today we're not required to follow the Old Testament ceremonial laws the way Mary and Joseph were required to do so which means we can eat things like pork and shellfish and we don't offer animal sacrifices for sin anymore because Christ has paid for our sin. But it does mean that we are called to obey the moral law of God. And so when we obey the law of God, we too fulfill God's wishes. We fulfill his will, but we also encourage others. Um, children, think about it this way. When you obey your mom and dad the first time, you're not only fulfilling the law of God, but you're encouraging your mom and dad. I know because I'm a dad, and I've experienced that, and it's been great. Husbands, when we love the wife that God has given us, when we love them sacrificially as Christ loved the church, we're fulfilling the law of God. But we're also encouraging our wives. And I would say if we have children, encouraging our children. We're showing our um, female children what they should look for in a spouse. And we're showing our sons uh, the kind of husbands that God is calling them to be in the future. Ladies, when you minister to other ladies, when you pray for them, when you reach out to them and spend time with them, you are fulfilling the law of God to encourage one another as long as it is day. And you are also encouraging them in the process. 
But Luke doesn't just give us a story about the baby Jesus. Um, he spends the rest of the chapter giving us a brief glimpse into the childhood of Jesus. It's only one story, but it's the only story of Jesus' childhood that we have from all four Gospels. Look with me very quickly at verse 39. Luke says this, When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, in other words, when Mary and Joseph were done in the temple with baby Jesus, they returned to home. They returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with the wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. In this one verse, Luke tells us three things about the baby Jesus. Number one, he grew in stature. That word simply refers to uh, growing up, getting older, kind of years of life, to use that language. Number two, he says that Jesus grew in wisdom. And the word that Luke uses here means both intellect and wisdom, but also means the ability to apply that wisdom to life. And we have to remember, this is sometimes a struggle for people to hear, but Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% man, which means he was 100% a baby and then a young boy as he grew, which means he had to learn things. Two plus two is four. If you put your hand on a hot pot, it's going to burn you. He learned from his father Joseph how to be a carpenter, how to make tables and chairs and other things like that. And sometimes this is a struggle to hear, but think of it this way. Jesus was never limited in regards to his deity, 100% God, no limitations whatsoever. And the only limitations that he had were in his 100% being a human, meaning he had to learn things that you and I had to learn as well. But then Luke also tells us that he grew in favor of God. In fact, the Greek reads this way, the grace of God was upon him. So in other words, Luke is telling us, listen, Jesus grew. He grew in wisdom, he got older, but most importantly, the favor and the grace of God was upon him. But babies don't stay babies, do they? They grow, and so we read the rest of the chapter, beginning in verse 41. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. The Jewish people obviously observed the Passover ever since it was inducted in Exodus. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, similar to the verse that we read earlier. Luke had many resources at his disposal when he wrote this narrative of Jesus. And yet he only gives us this one story of the boy Jesus. It begs the question, why? Why this particular story of all the ones that was available to him? Well, I think it's this reason. When Jesus was attending the Passover this particular year, he was 12, a year before 13. And it was the custom in those days that at that age, Jesus was expected to really shadow or follow his father Joseph as Joseph kind of administered the Passover meal to his family. He was supposed to get up close and personal with the Passover meal. Uh, think of it this way. In modern Jewish terms, it was like Jesus' bar mitzvah, to use that language. And in those days, families traveled together for many reasons. One of them, though, was for safety. The, the journey to Jerusalem could be dangerous. And the way the caravan would go would look like this. Uh, the mothers and the young babies would go, and young children go first. There'd be a little bit of a gap, and then the fathers, the husbands, would bring up the, the rear. Jesus, being a 12-year-old, kind of had an option. Some of those older children would help the mothers up front. Some of them would kind of hang back with each other. We sometimes see that at church, where the youth kind of gather together to spend time with each other, or they might choose to travel with the dads as well. I mention this because it explains how they could go a day without missing Jesus. No doubt Joseph looked around and thought, 
oh, Jesus isn't here. Obviously, he's with the boys up ahead, or he's with his mother, Mary. Mary thought the same thing opposite. Oh, Jesus is back with the boys, or he's back with Joseph. A simple mistake that any of, can happen to any of us. I remember in Florida years ago now, but Grayson was about a year and a half, and Grantham three and a half. Debbie and I had taken him to Disney World for one day, and we were leaving the park. And just outside the park, uh, a lot of people, it was crowded, it was near the end of the day. I looked down, and suddenly there's no Grantham. So I asked Debbie, hey, where's Grantham? What do you mean, where's Grantham? Why don't you have him? And what preceded was four and a half minutes of the longest of our married life. Uh, thankfully, some young college workers there found Grantham crying, obviously did the math, and eventually found us. So the separation was short-lived. Uh, but it's possible you have a story to share like that. Maybe you have temporarily lost one of your children, or maybe you were lost as a child. If you've experienced either of those, you know two things. Number one, it's terrifying. And number two, it can happen so quickly. And yet, that's not the significance of the story. That's not what this account is really about. As we keep uh, look back in verse 49, Jesus' response. So Mary and Joseph find him in the temple. Why did you do this to us? Don't you know we've been looking for you? What is his response? Verse 49, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? You know, Jesus' response is one of a matter-of-fact statement and even a question. Why were you looking for me? It's almost like he was saying, you of all people, as my parents, should know where to look first. You should have come straight to the temple. And this is not preteen sarcasm. It's not simple defiance. It was simply a statement of truth. We know how Jesus really felt about Mary and Joseph. Look at verse 51. He went down with them, came to Nazareth, and was submissive to them. He was obviously honoring his mother and his father. But most importantly, we need to remember about this count that what Mary and Joseph went through for those several days is not the point of these verses. The primary verb in this section doesn't even apply to them. It's found in verse 43. Luke tells us that when the party, to use that language, the caravan gathers up, Passover is over, verse 43, he tells us that Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Why? He stayed because he was only a 12-year-old boy, but more importantly, he felt drawn to the place where he wanted to be. He felt drawn to the place where he would commune with the Father. He felt drawn to the place where scriptures were being exposited, where he could ask questions, where he could dialogue with others about the things of God. This was a place he needed to be. And verse 49 should stand out to us. Our English translations tell us it reads this way. Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Literally in the Greek it says this. I must be in the things of my father. And I think that's why Luke gave us this account. As Jesus is preparing for manhood, um, as he is preparing to grow as a man, his heart is to be about one central thing, and that's the, the heart of his father. He had a singular purpose, to seek and to save that which was lost. And even at this young age, he knew what he was called to do, to obey and to submit to the will of the father. I must be in the things of my father. But what about you and I? What must you and I be in? What are we about as individuals, as families, as a church family? Jesus was all about being in the presence of his Father. He was about the things of God. But again, I ask, what about us? How do we pursue the things of God? Perhaps there's things that we have held on to too tightly in our lives. If those things are sinful, then I encourage all of us to confess and repent of those and come back to the Father. But maybe we've held on to some things that aren't necessarily sinful, uh, but we've put too much emphasis on them. Uh, maybe we need to reprioritize our priorities, or maybe more importantly, we need to be remember, we need to remember that we need to be about the things of God. Perhaps there are things that we've not pursued enough. Are we daily being fed God's word? Are we praying consistently? Are we pursuing our neighbors and our co-workers, our friends and our family members with the gospel of grace? Our text this morning reminds us that as God's children, we are called to fulfill his law. And we do this through obedience. And when we do, so many times this obedience is a huge encouragement to others. And yet this text reminds us of something greater. We don't always fulfill the law of God. We struggle with obedience at times. 
times we outright rebel and sin against God. In short, we fail. But Luke is reminding us, he's introducing us to one who never failed, to one who perfectly fulfilled the law of God, even as a baby, when his parents presented him to the Lord, and even as a 12-year-old boy, as he declared boldly he must be about his father's business. So may we too seek the father's business. May we seek to obey him always, to fulfill his law. But when we fail, may we once again come to the one who never failed. Uh, may we once again come to the one who always submitted to his father's will. May we once again come to the one who never sinned, not even once. May we once again come to Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that in it, this morning, we once again see the blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the faithfulness of Mary and Joseph to take the baby Jesus to the temple. And Father, we thank you that they, for years, took him to the Passover celebration in Jerusalem until that one fateful year where you would intentionally have Jesus stay behind. Father, we thank you that in Christ, you have done for us what we can never do for ourselves. And so, Lord, as we begin this week that you are calling us to, we pray, Lord, that we would be about the things of you. We pray, Lord, that you would direct our conversations, that you would direct our thoughts, our prayers, uh, the sacrifices that we will make, the things that we will do, as well as the things that we will choose not to do. Father, may it be for your glory. May it be for our good. May it be for the good of this community that you've called us to love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Very fitting this morning that we would conclude worship not only with singing, but with singing that great hymn of faith, Trust and Obey. Please follow your worship materials as Abby leads us through that great hymn of faith now. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His word, what a glory sheds on our way while we do his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in jesus but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but a smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sigh nor a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, 
or we'll walk by his side in the way what he says we will do where he sends we will go never fear only trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey So glad that you and your family were able to join us for online worship again this week. As you go to the week that the Lord has called you to, I offer his blessing to you in his name. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. And all God's people said, Amen.